So the air district is the first uh, regional air pollution um, district in the whole US, um, created in 1955 to regulate um, air pollution in the Bay Area. And if you live long enough, you will remember in the 50s, the air quality wasn't as good as it is now. Like the air quality here is almost like as, as bad as London in the Industrial Revolution. So, but we serve roughly about 8 million people um, across the Bay Area, uh, from Santa Rosa down to San Jose, uh, um, east to Solano County. So. Um, next, um, I think, yeah. And then we issue daily air quality for, forecasts and burn decisions uh, for the whole Bay Area. Um, so next slide. Uh, one more. Um, maybe I'll try to click through all those, I think, yeah. Uh, I think one more click. Yeah, um, so I, so there are multiple steps to um, forecast air quality. First, we need to know what happened in the past. So we look at um, how the air quality was doing like yesterday or the day before, and then also what's doing it now. So for example, for today, it was pretty good like yesterday and today, um, other than some very high smoke from the oak fire from way above us, but that's not really impacting us. And then we have like observations, um, um, from weather stations across the whole world um, that give us like what is going on with the wind flow across the Bay Area. And then we have weather models, um, large scale, um, like covering the entire North America or the world. And then we have like local scale weather models that focus in the Bay Area um, or Northern California. Once, once we get all those information, then we have uh, equations, we put in numbers and then it will spit out um, how much um, air pollution we think the Bay Area sings. And then we will make a forecast on how much ozone and how much PM2.5, which PM2.5 means particulate matter. That's almost like um, when you burn wood in the winter, um, you um, the wood, uh, the process is not perfect. So you're going to produce some very tiny pollution particles that when it get into your lung, it may just get stuck in your lung and um, potentially it can cause lung cancer. So that's why we're very concerned with PM2.5 um, in the winter. But now with the wildfire seasons, PM2.5 is all year round. And then ozone is mostly a summer thing. And then one, if the air quality get um, above a certain threshold, then we'll recommend spare the air alerts. Next slide. Oh, oh yeah, this one. So we need to grab um, information from the past and current. Um, so the leftmost image um, is just a lot of small air quality sensors, most of them from purple air, but also EPA sensors. Um, this map just shows you the air quality across the whole Bay Area is pretty good. And then we have satellites. So satellite is almost like a camera from space, taking pictures of what is happening um, down to earth. And uh, this image just shows you um, there are lots of marine strata covering along the coast. So the air quality along the coast is pretty good. Inland is um, mostly sunny. So the air quality may not be as good as along the coast. The one image on the upper far right, um, that just shows you what the wind is doing and what's the temperature and what's the wind speed across the Bay Area. And you can kind of tell the wind is like coming from the west and northwest across the Bay Area into inland area. The lower left image um, shows you um, uh, what are the current big fires uh, that will help us to forecast where the smoke is going to go. And then the last picture in the lower right um, is a lot of um, webcam image, webcam network across California. Um, and when they sense a hotspot, the camera will just zoom to the fire. And this one is Oak Fire uh, from a few days ago. Next slide. And then once we have um, information about what is the we what was the weather doing and what is the weather currently, then we look at what is going to happen in the future. The image in the upper left is um, a just a large scale weather model showing what's the wind doing overall in a big picture kind of sense. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of see the wind is like there's a high pressure in the eastern Pacific Ocean. So that's like a typical summer pattern. So we'll get strong wind along the coast, northwest to west wind, uh, but bringing clean air into California. Um, the middle slide 
is um shows you the details of what the wind is doing across the Bay Area. And then the one to the right is um, from the National Weather Service, they have a weather model forecasting how high the ocean will get. But you can see this one is not too detailed. It's like very tough to tell like what exactly or how high the number is. Like there's no way for us to even find out um, like how high the air quality will, um, air pollution will get. So we actually have to one in-house um, equation to help us forecast. And then the image to lower right is, um, it just shows you where the models think the smoke is going. Next slide. And once we have all those information that we can make a weather forecast on how, uh, air quality forecast on how high um, the air quality will get. Um, so um, AQI, you may have heard about like from zero to 500. Most of the time it stay at zero to 50 or 51 to 100. That means the air is good to moderate. But once the air get up to 101 or higher, then we'll have to easily spare the air alerts, letting people know the air quality is not healthy. So you may want to stay indoor when you smell smoke inside or when you are sensitive, you may avoid exposing to the air outdoor. So next slide. Uh, one more quick. So as I mentioned before, uh, in the winter time, we are very concerned about um, PM 2.5, and then in the summer, we're concerned with ozone. And so one of the things you may notice about um, San Francisco Bay Area is that it's very cold in the summer. Um, that's because of the ocean off the coast is um, it's really cold. It's only in the 50, 50 degrees. So that kind of like always like give us a strong inversion near the ground. So what that means is that all the pollution we make at the ground there's no way for it to escape to the whole depth of the atmosphere. It's kind of trapped in the lowest one mile or half a mile of the atmosphere. And when the inversion depth is very narrow, uh, very time, uh, very like narrow near the ground, then that's when we have the bad air days. Um, and today we, um, the inversion layer is pretty deep. It's like up to like 2000 feet or 3000 feet. So it has like all the air pollution we have has a lot more room to move around like in 2000 feet instead of like 100 feet. In the summer, um, when we, uh, we are also concerned with ozone, so far this year is not too bad. When the temperatures get up to 95 degrees or higher and we don't have um, wind from the ocean, that's when we tend to have the pollution kind of get stuck in the Bay Area um, and not really going anywhere. And that's when we get high ozone. And one of the thing with ozone is that when you breathe in the high ozone air, it will kind of burn your lung. So it may not cause cancer, but it will cause like discomfort um, when you're exercising outdoors. So usually in the afternoon, we, uh, when the ozone is high, we recommend people to like limit your outdoor exposure or limit exercise so that your lung doesn't burn from high ozone. Uh, next slide. Let's see. So, um, Traditionally, we are just fo focusing on um, ozone and PM 2.5. And we have a skill of like one to three days of like how high those get. But now um, wildfire is getting more and more often. Um, and um, especially since 2018 with the campfire, like we almost have big wildfire every single year. And um, that kind of changed the equation how we work. We um, are now looking at more sources of information, focusing in very local scale um, um, topography and wind flow and help us to determine whether San Francisco Bay Area will get impacted by wild, wildfire smoke. Um, next slide. So this graph shows you how many bad air days we have um, before the pandemic. Um, so ozone, um, uh, um, the, um, the horizontal line shows you the time of the month of year, so from January to de December. So the top graph shows you ozone is a summertime phenomenon. As you can see, we have bad air days starting in April, and then it gets worse and worse. And um, it get the worst time of the year is actually September, which is surprising because um, in June, July, August, we are influenced by the strong sea breeze, and that kind of kept the temperature in the Bay Area colder than September. September uh, September is actually our warmest month as we start to get um, wind from inland area coming down 
the Sierra Nevada and to the Bay Area. And September is usually our warmest month. The second graph shows you uh, PM 2.5. And you can see PM 2.5 before the pandemic and before the wildfire season um, happened mostly in the winter months, like December and January, they're the peak, peak, peak month. Next slide. So the, this one, um, it, includes um, the wildfires of 2018, 19, and 20. And if you look at the second graph again, now we actually have more um, bad air days for PM215 in the month of August, September, October, and November. And those are from wildfires happening in the later parts of the summer season. And one of the thing you may have also noticed is um, there may be a few more days um, for ozone bad, a bad ozone day. So ozone and PM2.5, there's a relationship. So ozone, if you have more PM2.5, um, it can jack up the ozone reading at times. So uh, there's some kind of chemical reaction going on, but it's something that we're still trying to learn. It's a very new research topic, so. But um, the simple story is that smoke will cause more air pollution, including PM2.5 and ozone. Um, next slide. Um, so this graph is just trying to tell you um, the air quality in the Bay Area has some make some big improvement. Um, so the horizontal axis uh, show you the year uh, from 2000 to 2021. The green line is the um, shows you how many um, bad air days there are for PM 2.5, and you can see uh, the, the blue line is the three year running average. So the main story is just showing you the air quality has been improving from 2000 all the way to 2016. Um, um, as we are, uh, like people are uh, doing better in terms of like, pull, uh, pull, um, pull, um, like getting the air quality better. However, um, starting in 2017 and 18, that's when we start to see more wildfires. Now we're seeing a reversing trend. We're seeing more bad air days due to the wildfires. Uh, next, day, uh, next slide. And this graph um, shows you the same idea. So this one shows you the AQI for each day of the year. Um, they are color code according to um, um, like how bad the air is. And you can see like from 2010 to 2017, there were not many like oranges, there are not many red days, but starting in 2017, you start to see like lots of reds, lots of purple. Um, and those are all from wildfires. So if we can find a way to avoid wildfires, then the air quality in the Bay Area will be really good. But um, that's something that like we'll have to all work on trying to like limit um, these wildfires. Um, next slide. Oh, let's see. Um, skip this slide. So um, our air quality forecasting team has changed the way we operate. Before we just make weather forecasts, but with the wildfire happening years after years now, we start to make more um, products for public to use. Like we make, um, my coworker here will record like a presentation and then we'll put it up on Instagram, uh, Twitter, so, and, and Facebook. So people have another way to get the information. And before the wildfires um, in 2017, 18, we usually just give out like a number of uh, like how bad the air quality, quality is. And now we are making videos to try to explain where we think the air quality will be the worst and um, the reason why we're trying to give more information. And then we are also working with um, the state, the federal and local agencies trying to get the message out so that the public health can be uh, protected. Um, next slide. So um, we, are, we have been like working on things like trying to understand how smoke impacts health and trying to work with other agencies um, in the federal, state and local level. And um, we're trying to learn more about wildfire, wildfire response. Like most of us, when we go to school, we don't really know too much about wildfire, but now it's a thing that happens years after year. So we need to adapt and just learn about the science of wildfire and how it impacts public. Uh, and we will be working with, um, continue to work with agency like the National Weather Service, 
and also the California Air Resource Board. That's our, our mother agency. So um, California Air Resource Board is um, it has um, it has power over all the air districts. So we're trying to work with them to um, to um, like when there's a wildfire, they have a power to uh, put in new sensors near the fire, so we can get more information. So we work with um, um, the air resource board to um, try to get more information when there the are wildfires. And then we're also trying to do more like short-term air quality advisory forecasts. You may have noticed this year with the marsh fire in Con Contra Costa County, we 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 um we monitor the situation daily and try to um issue air quality advisory for those areas. And now we we're doing like air quality advisory for Oak Fire. On um, next slide. So one of the things you may have heard about is purple air. Um, the map into the white is like it shows you all the senses um, that are purple air. So um, it's purple air is gives you really good information for um, for a low cost. So they are very good. However, they have some shortcomings. Um, when the air pollution get really really high, um, they get they tend to get, get like readings that are not like believable, but it shows you an idea, like the air quality is bad um, over a area if there's no EPA sensor. So um, the purple air is definitely a um, good good information, but you have to, you cannot just like trust it 100%. You have to just use it um, combined with other information like the EPA sensor and our air quality forecast from the Bay Area, Bay Area Air District and other sources of information. Uh, next slide. Um, yeah, so um, this is like how our forecast process is working. Um, you can get um, our air quality forecast on spiritair.org. And um, thank you for everyone like um, to do your part to help um, keep our air clean also. Thank you so much, Richard, for all the rich information. We want to pause here and open it up for questions. We know that was a lot. Um, some of those were, were very technical pieces. Um, some other pieces folks might be familiar with, but let's pause here and see what questions uh, you all have. Feel free to put them in the chat, or if you'd like to, it's a small enough group, I think you can unmute and also um, just ask your question. We'll give folks a moment to formulate questions. Again, you can chat, you can unmute, whatever you feel comfortable with. I have a question. Hi, my name is Rose. I'm a community engagement specialist with the Sequoia Foundation. And I'm curious over your time working um, with FOCMED, what have been your most successful and least successful endeavors in reaching hard to reach communities, especially those that are most affected by poor air quality in kind of informing them on air quality if you've partnered with any other organizations to kind of get the word out and get education out about air quality. Richard, would you like to speak to that at all or should community engagement oh, speak to that? I think communication may be able to answer this better because we are mostly on the back end, like we give out information, yeah. Sure, I can share just a little bit of information, Rose, from my vantage point. I'm not with the communications office, but um, you know, you you make a really good point. We have so many different languages spoken in the Bay Area, so many different populations, um, folks who may work outdoors and and may not have the opportunity to um, create a clean airspace. So um, uh, one of the pieces that Richard had lifted up was um, how the air district's wildfire response has really pivoted towards, instead of just sharing out data and just kind of putting the number out there to the public and leaving it at that, a more coordinated response. And so there has been a, a lot of work um, with local public health agencies um, and with regional efforts um, to, to look at how can we get information out to all sorts of individuals, including the most vulnerable. Um, so what we can do is we can share some information to um, just so folks have it handy since air quality forecasting is very closely linked to um, wildfire safety and, and wildfire response. 
but I'll put a link in the chat to some of our resources there. Um, some of those are in, available in different languages. Um, and we do work as well to communicate with um, media, uh, multi, multilingual media, so that we can have some of those more in-depth conversations in that kind of a forum to, to share some information. There's always more work to be done. Of course, it's a huge metropolitan area with a lot of different needs. And so um, we'd love to hear from you all if you have recommendations of other ways we could get this information out to folks. Um, I do see a question in the chat. Uh, the question is, do you run a unique regression analysis for each zone? And do you have a technical paper on this method? And thank you, Ron, for lifting that up from the Tri-Valley Air Quality Community Alliance. Yeah, um, so our question is actually forecasting for the worst case scenario um, for, the, for the whole Bay Area. And then we treat the number for different zones, like we have five different zones, like the North Zone, uh, the South Zone, um, and then the Eastern Zone. Um, so like um, we, we recently treat our regression a little bit um, like before 2018, our regression doesn't account for fire. Uh, and now we have our regression accounts for fire. So in, in case there's a big fire near the Bay Area and we have smoke impact, what we'll do is we'll add 13 to um, 13 PBB to the ozone. So what that means, like when we have uh, the ozone number is over 71, that's mean the AQI is unhealthy for sensitive, sensitive groups. So 13, out of 71, that's pretty significant. So uh, we like, so if there's a wildfire, we increase like almost 20% of um, ozone um, concentration. So like we, we did make some tricks. Um, so in the summertime, um, we know um, the Eastern zone, like areas like east of the Oakland Hills, like for example, areas like Livermore usually have the highest ozone. So we aim to forecast the worst conditions for the Livermore area. And then we will treat um, the numbers from that number, uh, from the Livermore number um, and lower it for other zones because other areas tend to be much greener than, than Livermore. And that means like in the summertime, we tend to have the worst air quality for the ozone, usually in Eastern zone, which include Livermore and also Santa Clara zone, which includes San Jose and Point South uh, because those areas tend to be the warmest. In the wintertime um, for PM 2.5, we usually forecast for the worst conditions, usually for uh, the northern zone, which include like Napa, um, like and areas like near Santa Rosa. Those are the areas that tend to be the coldest, and that's when people burn the most amount of wood to heat the house in the winter time. So, um, so we kind of forecast for the worst case scenario, and then go on from there and um, lower the number for other areas. Are you able to accommodate for uh, improvements in uh, emissions? In other words, reduction in emissions by more electric vehicles or less diesel or, or uh, the success of spare the air days? Do you, do you try to accommodate the uh, changes in emissions over time? Um, this is a very tough question. Uh, we don't have data from like the DOT, even like, even like when I'm doing research project on that, like I actually have to send a public data request asking um, MTC to send us like traffic data for us. Like, so um, we don't know, uh, the simple answer is we don't know because like we just don't um, really have real-time traffic data even to really um, know the really the impact on uh, our, uh, like, mm, uh, the impacts that like, maybe people drive less, but we don't know, like we just don't have the real time data, so. Okay, thank you. Very good. So feel free, if there are additional questions, feel free to put those in the chat or unmute. And I do have a question for you, Richard, about the air quality index. And I know that we are one of uh, 35 air districts in the state. And we know that um, smoke and air quality certainly don't always respect um, air sheds. Right, and so I'm wondering, do do you all as meteorologists, do you coordinate with the other air districts um, around our air district? Are you in contact with them at all, looking at um, what they call and and some of those different factors? Is there any relationship there? Yeah, so uh, we have a burn program. So what that means is, let's say a farm wants to burn um, the stuff from last season to fertilize the soil, um, we can say oh, today the conditions is not good for smoke dis dispersion. So we're going to say no burn. 
um, and then they won't be able to burn anything um, um, for the farm. So uh, we have, like, so we try to work on that. And if other air district like talk to us saying, oh, um, the wind today is not really good. Like it's going to bring all the smoke from your area to our area. Then um, we'll work together to uh, limit the amount of burning we do um, so. Thank you for that. <clears throat> I know that um, Richard had offered as well to share some information if folks are interested about the unfortunate fire that's taking place right now, the Oak Fire um, in the Mariposa area. And so what we can do is we can, <clears throat> excuse me, leave the chat open if other questions come to mind about um, air quality forecasting, um, you can certainly lift those up at any time. And then perhaps we can um, make sure that Richard has the ability to share screen and maybe you could share some information about what you're seeing and, and um, what you're looking at with the Oak Fire, Richard. Yeah, I can do that now. Uh, let's see. Uh, can you see, see I'm, hold on. I'm sharing screen. Okay. Okay. This one, share. Can you see, um, let's see, can you see, um, the screen now, like with, yes, yes, we can. Do do you see the bar right now, like the zoom bar, or you don't see the bar? Okay, let's see. Okay, so this is the current satellite imagery uh, for the Bay Area. I want to point out several things. Um, so along the coast, you see like there's some um, white stuff. So they are the moon stratus. They are very stubborn today. Like if you're on the western side of, this, of San Francisco, you're still stuck in cloud. Um, and then also along the moon coast. Um, and, and then I want you to focus on this in this area. So this is where the oak fire is. And you can see there are some smoke deferment. Um, and the way you can kind of tell is in stuff like white color, like those clouds are, is a little bit more brownish. That's can you can kind of tell from whether it's clouds or smoke. So the smoke is slowly moving northwestward. Um, and then the problem today is there are all these clouds over the Sierra Nevada. So that makes the forecasting very tough because like this is like a camera. So um, the, the high clouds, they are kind of over the fire and the smoke is so it's shielding what's underneath. So that's very tricky. So they are actually kind of like making our job a little bit difficult today. But the good thing is the fire is really far away, like 200 miles away from the Bay Area. So we kind of have time to see what is gonna happen. Um, and this web page is pretty new. It's called Watch Duty. It just shows you all the fire in the state of California. And then it also, when you zoom in, it shows you the boundary of the fire issued by the um, agencies that work, work on the fire. And also those dots indicate how, how uh, where are the hot spots, which means where the fire is burning right now. Um, and the good thing is that you can see there are lots of hot spots, but they are kind of like orange. They're not a really strong, like, so the color scale is, um, if it is the most recent, you see the bright red, but all you can see is just like kind of orange and like maybe light red. So that means the fire is kind of old or the fire is not as active. So that's a good thing. So if this fire like become less active, that means it's going to produce less smoke. So that's a good thing because that means we won't have to deal with the smoke anymore, but uh, we're still watching the situation. Right now it's still early afternoon. So the fire can, can still go crazy by like 5 p.m. today. So. And then the two we used to um, look at like whether the smoke is happening is um, using the radar, which is kind of a new thing. Like 10 years ago, we don't even know the radar can do that. You, you thought the radar is look at like the wing drops, where the wing is. So this is showing like there's some wing showers over the Sierra Nevada with, um, with um, a weak disturbance uh, right now. But then you can also kind of see there may be some smoke um, near this area. So the way the beam is like, is um, the way the location is like in um, in like Santa Cruz County, and then it just shoot out. And when the way the beam goes up, 
in distance, it will go up in height. So by the time you get to this area in the Sierra Nevada, it's looking at like maybe 20,000 feet or so. So if the smoke is not getting up to 20,000 feet, we have nothing to see it. So this may be a good thing for now is that there may not be any smoke right now of the fire is not as active. But as the, as, as the afternoon goes on, we'll start to see more smoke. Uh, and a way to look at the smoke is that um, we want to look at the area that's not moving. Um, and that can tell us where the fire is. Um, rain, usually they are moving objects. So um, that's how you can tell whether it's rain or smoke uh, using radar. And then this is another different um, interpretation of where the fire is. Um, they kind of trick around the color scale. So you can see they are trying to indicate the fire is over in this area. Um, but then you can see there's now some clouds coming over the fire. So it's kind of um, making, um, tracking the fire more difficult. And then we also have air quality sensor across the area. And um, you can see most of the Bay Area is still pretty good. But when you go to near the fire, which is in this location, now you start to see some red and purple, which means the air quality is really bad. And um, the wind flow is going from southeast to northwest. Um, so, and good thing is that the stations across um, northeastern parts of the Sacramento Valley, they are not really seeing that much air pollution. That's a good thing because like, if the smoke gets to that area, what it does usually at night is the wind kind of come down the valley and that will kind of bring the smoke down into the Bay Area. But right now we're not seeing that. So that's a good thing. All the smoke right now is still kind of like moving over to Nevada, not really impacting the Bay Area. Um, but you may still see, still see some smoke way above us, like at 20,000 feet, which will give you nice sunrise and sunset pictures. And um, so this is a website by Purple Air. They also shows you the same idea, like good air quality across the Bay Area, very bad air quality near the fires, and also in Lake Tahoe. Um, and then, um, so this is a high resolution, high resolution model showing like what the model thinks this book is going to go. And this one is for um, the whole depth of the atmosphere. So this is like most of the book is um, above us. So you can see we'll get impact by smoke at some time during the next two days or so, but they will be just mostly above us. And then this one is the important one that we look for. This one shows you the smoke near the ground surface. So this one is where we actually care. The other one is just for kind of like um, nice sunrise and sunset pictures. So, so this one, what it shows is that we have really strong west to east wind and that's going to keep all the smoke away from the Bay Area. And um, so right now it looks like the smoke will just hang over in Yosemite National Park uh, into Nevada. So we're not going to really get impacted by, by this smoke the next two days or so. But, so that's all I have for this uh, oak fire. Thank you so much for that detailed behind the scenes look, Richard. It's it's really fascinating. You mentioned the Watch Duty website. Is that something that anybody can go to? Yeah, I think that one is like um is um, on Google. Like you can Google search, and you um that's I think that's the best website we have. Uh, our team has found so far this year. Like. Okay. Um, there, there have been some good website like by the San Francisco Chronicle, but you have to pay to use it. So like um, this one's for you, so. That's a great resource. I'm sure many of us have multiple apps on our phone at this point so that we can cross check and triangulate. And it's always interesting to hear how the professionals do it and, and how you look at what's coming up for air quality. Let's pause there and ask again, um, any questions from, from folks? Um, on this piece, um, monitoring the smoke from the Oak Fire um, or any other components discussed today about air quality forecasting, air quality index. Okay, well, I'm not seeing any. We'll stay on the line for just a moment or so if, if folks do have any lingering questions that pop up. I um, want to thank you all. Um, and let's see, I do see a question coming in here. Um, okay, I was curious about the slide you skipped showing the 500 MB maps. Does this show a worst case scenario? 
Um, and I believe that was for the Vallejo area, but I'm not um, not quite sure, Richard. Yeah, the reason why I didn't show that map is I felt that map is um, that map is so, way too intense, so I kind of skip it over. But if you guys want me to explain, I think that's the purpose of that slide is that explaining like I think the two um, weather maps so similar weather conditions, but one is before we have spare the air program, and the one is after we have spare the air program, and just showing like the air quality has improved, like we have less spare air day um, with the introduction of this spare air program. Um, um, yeah, we have um, less bad air days uh, with the introduction of the spare air program. Good, so it is making a difference. Everything that we do when we do get those spare the air alerts and we try to modify our individual behavior, we try and, um, you know, obviously the, the no burn days and things like that. What you're saying, Richard, is that it does make a difference. It is important. Yeah. But um, another cool thing I can share with um, the pandemic actually changed the way beha people behave. Like there were days like where they get really cold um, in the winter and we call spare the air, but it never happens because like people may be uh, working from home in Hawaii instead of working from home in, um, in the Bay Area. So like the pandemic is like, it changed the way uh, we're still trying to learn um, like how to adapt to the um, ch constantly changing situation. Like, how people working from home or working from office that can change the whole dynamics. Great, and we do have another question. Thanks for these questions coming in the chat. It's so interesting to see. Um, so Terry asks, is it true that um, we see a wildfire plume? If the smoke color is white, the fire is under control. And if it's darker, it's not. Can you speak a little bit, Richard, to the, the colors um, of the wildfire plumes? Um. So uh, I'll go back to the satellite imagery. Hmm. Uh, one. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. So um, it's tough to tell because like, the white is actually clouds and then um, the white along the coast is also clouds. And then the smoke tends to be a little bit more grayish, but um, there are different channels we look at. Like, so this one is called salt wave. Um, so this one, the way we look at it is like, you can see the black dots here. Uh, so that's where the fire is. And, and if it gets really, really black, that means that like um, the fire is very active. But to look at smoke, um, let's see. So this one is the natural color, color fire. That's the best way to um, really look at where the fire and smoke is. Um, it Like with this one, you can tell um, this channel is trying to ex um, separate the, um, the smoke from the cloud. The cloud, it looks like it's a little bit more white and bluish um, because there are water vapor in it. But the smoke is just gray because uh, it's just the composition of um, like the way um, the chemistry it works on the satellite. Yeah, it's very difficult to explain. Like, I may not be able to explain it that well. Hopefully, that answers your question. That's really interesting. Thanks for speaking to the the content of water vapor. Um, and hopefully, Terry, that helps answer your question. But feel free to um, uh, ask ask more if you have more questions about that. Great. Okay, well, thank you so much, everybody. Again, we'll stay on the line if other questions um, pop up and we will be sharing this recording. Give us a few days to um, process it and get that um, link available to everybody. But we so appreciate your time and, and your participation. Um, again, we are unfortunately entering uh, wildfire season. And so we know that all this information is extremely important. Um, and so thank you, Richard, for taking us behind the scenes and, and letting us peek at some of what you do. It's um, very technical and, and very important. Thank you everybody for joining and stay feel free, free, feel free to stay on if you have more questions.